we need a new focus for economic thinking. We need a form of economics that takes narratives seriously. If you look at the percent of articles in each academic discipline that have the word narrative in them, you can see that history and anthropology and sociology, they love narratives. They're well aware of it. The worst field in academia for understanding of the importance of narratives is finance. I'll be talking here about a book that I've just written about this, Narrative Economics, How Stories Go Viral and Drive Major Economic Events. I think it's important to learn about economic narratives because they're a fundamentally underlying driving force for the economy. We can't pretend that it doesn't exist. So what is an economic narrative? You can think about that as, as a sort of disease that follows uh, contagion uh, models that are described by epidemiologists in the medical school. Let's pursue that. This shows an epidemic curve, the diagram, for the Ebola virus. One outbreak of the virus in Lofa County, Liberia, in 2014. For week after week, there were more and more cases of Ebola being reported. And then it starts to fade away. It doesn't go away all at once. This is called an epidemic curve. And the curve tends to be hump-shaped. It grows for a while, and then it just stops growing. There are still new cases, but they decline. It has to do with the contagion rate and the recovery rate. The contagion rate during the rising period is greater than the recovery rate, so more and more people are getting in. Eventually, it fails, and then while there are still new cases, they decline. This is the same kind of chart for an economic variable. What I have here is the advanced economy's unemployment rate for the whole world. And it looks kind of like a pair of epidemics, two different outbreaks of a disease called pessimism, maybe, or some financial uncertainty or something like that. I don't mean to say that I've proven, just looking at these two diagrams, that uh, economic fluctuations are like epidemics. But I want to say that something big was driving the whole world economy. Uh, and, you know, economists really don't have a clear understanding just what it was. Okay, we want to understand big and important economic events, those that really matter. What causes them? But a lot of economists will th talk about the central bank made some mistake or the parliament did something wrong with the tax system. Those are contributors to big events. But ultimately, I think it's contagion of stories. Stories don't have to be truthful or good or uh, inherently interesting. All they have to do is go viral. There has to be some contagion rate at a moment in time that brings them uh, in excess of the recovery rate, the forgetting rate. Now, I think narrative economics, which I'm defining in my book, is in some sense a subset of behavioral economics. But in another sense, it's very different. Behavioral economics does research in psychology and how it applies to economic behavior, but it looks for consistent behavioral patterns. What I'm looking for in narrative economics is something that's inconsistent through time. It's changing human behavior, modeled by stories that go viral and change people's perspective on, on life and economics. In my book, I talk about perennial economic narratives, narratives that repeat themselves through time with mutation that brings them up to date. But there's some stories that are inherently motivating, and you keep seeing them coming back. For example, we have narratives about labor-saving machines, a machine that will take your job away, do your job for you. Fear of these actually goes back to ancient times, but with not very strong. It was in the 19th century that they first started to appear with the mechanical looms that were replacing the jobs of weavers in the early 19th century in the United Kingdom, the Luddite story. The growth of the term labor-saving machines, it became a big fear. A lot of it was in agriculture, uh, harvesters or uh, the cotton gin or something like that that were replacing jobs in the country. Later, the new term technological unemployment appeared. Uh, they thought robots were taking over. 
People find that hard to believe today. But you know, the narrative can take forms that you would not expect. And it was a strong reason for pessimism and for reluctance to buy or invest. Then there was the automation narrative, which took off in the 1950s. Uh, and it was about machines controlling machines. It wasn't just a labor-saving machine. It was a scientist in a control room pushing buttons and running a whole factory with no employees. And then finally, coming on most recently, is the artificial intelligence narrative, which is driving us today. And it's suddenly becoming powerful. Each of these narratives has its own contagious element. Uh, what we have more recently is driverless cars. And it makes you think, what are these taxi drivers and truck drivers going to do, be doing in the future? Another important narrative that's changed a lot through time is a, a confidence narrative. And what I mean is perceptions of the confidence of other people. This narrative developed in the mid-19th century for the term financial panic. Uh, they also used the term banking panic or bank run. It was a story typically of people hearing about other people panicking. And then, uh, like, after someone shouts fire in a crowded theater, that was a metaphor they used. It scares everybody. There's no fire. Just everybody calm down. But they wouldn't calm down. And so they were looking at each other, looking for signs of panic. Now, business confidence. This represents a mutation of the narrative. It's not so much about depositors pulling their money out. It's about businessmen not being uh, confident enough of the economy to make investments and to hire people. Consumer confidence. That doesn't appear until essentially well into the 20th century. And it was a new idea, again, a different narrative, that you better watch out. Consumers might stop spending at any time if they get worried. All of these confidence stories are still with us, and any one of them can still mutate and come back to scare people and produce another economic crisis. Economists need to start sorting through narratives, and the general public should have some understanding in a, uh, of this phenomenon as well. We need to know about the various mutations and strains of narratives that, narratives that might come back uh, in a new epidemic. We need to study narratives much as entomologists study species of bugs and ornithologists study species of birds. It's only then that we can have a thorough understanding of major economic events.